Hello, how are you all doing today? It looks like we've got almost everybody in that's probably going to be in today. I know there's a couple people who let me know they were going to be out tonight. So I guess let's go ahead and start and just uh, want to just sort of recap a little bit that we've looked at the way historical events play into the development of music in, in Texas and therefore to Austin and specific events like uh, Angelina Everly's firing of the cannon, um, the presence of Guy Town as a prototype entertainment district that will come full circle in a hundred years. Um, we've heard the, the narrow theory of the music hall and the, and the alternative press and, uh, and seeing the way music progresses, popular music progresses from uh, marching bands in the late 1800s to parlor tunes to recordings and broadcasts and how Texas has contributed to all of these different um, uh, eras and genres of music that have come through. But music scenes in the 1950s and especially in the 60s developed, seemed to develop around here around specific clubs. Um, and sometimes these were just an extension of the ethnic culture that developed them, like the, like Dessau Hall that was originally uh, founded and built by the German community, uh, or uh, the SPJST halls. But th there's really no question that country music you know, was king in the 50s at, at places like Dessau and the Skyline, and then in the 60s it, it broke and spoke. Remember that, that early rock and roll wasn't really known as rock and roll in, in the, the earliest uh, accounts I have of Elvis touring through here in Texas, he's referred to as Western Bob. And that was really kind of the phrase that was, that was used to designate rock and roll back then. And I think this suggests a, a, a perceived relationship of rock as being country based, more so than maybe being blues based, which I think it is equally. But I think at the time, the, uh, the perception is that it's more country based. Um, and then country music goes through an awful lot of changes in the, in the 50s and particularly the 60s. By the 60s, you get a uh, something called kind of country politan, which is a, a much more upscale, uh, appealing to maybe more city folks who who are still from the country. You found this a lot in radio over the years, but now television so, sort of steps in, and with the um, especially with the popularity of people like Porter Wagner and and Dolly Parton, this this country politan sound begins to develop. Uh, um, Hawk comes on TV mm -hmm. is sort of a, a, a different element of that. They're more sort of rural and, and country. But country politan, I think, is what's going to set the stage for, for the rebellion of country music that will occur uh, at the end of the 60s. <clears throat> at the same time, uh, in the 60s, folk music was fo fostered on campus at the UT Folk Sings and at Thread Gill's open mic sessions. Uh, you had a really great and smoking blues, R&B, jazz, and soul scene happening over on the east side that was fed in part by the uh, by Anderson High School and also by uh, the, the jazz programs and music programs at Houston Tillotson College. There are um, clubs like the Bitfree Grill, Charlie's Playhouse, the IL Club, Ernie's Chicken Shack were very important to, to keeping those, those sounds going because they not only kept the, the black bands performing, but they, kept, uh, they, kept a lot, they got a lot of money from the white kids that were coming over there. And, uh, and I think that that was a good influx because as we talked about too, during the, the after the Civil Rights Act, a lot of the impetus for staying in East Austin kind of left because blacks no longer had to stay there. They could go out anywhere and patronize any business around perfectly legally, and why not? Um, but unfortunately, it caused a kind of a decline in, in club attendance by the end of the, the 60s, so um, 1970 is going to look very different for, for that group of clubs. But uh, as far as rock music goes, I mean, there were, there were rock clubs in the mid-60s here, the Jade Room, the Swingers Club, also known as the Action Club, the New Orleans Club, the Saracen. As we talked about, the Vulcan opened in 1967. It closes in uh, 1970. It brought a West Coast style of club to Austin, that sort of Fillmore family dog was that on style. Was uh, The Vulcan, yes. It was, uh, I believe, Congress. 306. South North, Congress, I North, believe. North Congress. North Congress. It's just second or uh, 200, 300 block. Yes, yeah. it is 300 block. It later became Duke's Royal Coach Inn that, right after Club Foot, and so that was, oh, you know, and it, 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 it was, was a bar. Something here recently, while, they were putting music in there and saying, you know, this is the old Vulcan. So, so like by the Copa now? Huh? 
By the coat, by the It's by the elephant room? No, it's on the other side of the street. It's on the west side. Yes, it is on the west side. It's almost to the corner, but not quite. It's like a couple doors down. On there. But the, but the one thing to remember about the, the Vulcan too, we talked about how uh, they they uh, brought with them the great graphic presence of the, of the posters with them, and how when uh, in uh, when the statesmen wouldn't run their ads, they they responded by printing even bigger posters, which is why you see those oh, big yeah, old yeah, yeah. Vulcan posters these days. Um, but places like the Vulcan and the Texas Pop Festival, which had happened in 1969. Uh, just north of Dallas, Fort Worth, and other local gatherings like the Longhorn Jazz Festival, which happens during the 60s here, KHFI Summer Music Series, and even uh, Aquafest. These encourage further gather, uh, further community through the gathering of the tribes, so to speak. Um, also, right at the end of, of the 60s, uh, KAZZ that we had talked about, who was very popular um, FM station here in town, and used to to broadcast and record a lot of local bands becomes KOKE right at the end of, of uh, 1969 and into 1970, but they're not going to quite be the KOKE we know until just a couple of years. Um, these scenes were not necessarily connected very closely, I don't think, until the 60s when sort of the countercultural philosophy uh, of hippies suggested to embrace all cultures in, in sort of a really true American fashion. So I think that the, the, the playground or, or is, is pretty, pretty clear then for anybody to come on the field. And that's why, uh, especially in those late 60s um, pop festivals, you see a, a really quite a broad array of, of genres of music being, being played there. And um, certainly at that time, you still have a KVET that, that still still has it, its, its niche broadcasting, so they, they still have Dr. Hepcat on the air, and no Jay Fiesta as well as, as uh, playing other, other musical programs, so they're starting to lean toward country a lot at this time. KNOW AM is the primary top 40 station then, and as I said, KAZZ becomes COCAP in there. KHFI is also a very popular uh, pop rock station at that period of time. The, uh, the Ranger, which is a, uh, a publication from UT, sort of a satire publication, and the RAG will supplement uh, the American Statesman, the Austin American, and the Austin Citizen. Do you all remember the Austin Citizen? Mm -hmm. Yep. The weekly newspaper that was published around town. But they, they're going to, to sort of cut in a little bit by appealing to the counterculture, you know. If, if uh, the Statesman won't run these, these ads, you know, believe me, another newspaper is going to pop up now and tell the kids about it because people want to know what's happening out there. But you could also go to places like uh, hip clothing stores and record stores and head shops, and these places also carry both, you know, merchandise and the message of the change in the counterculture. One of the biggest things that, that's happening right in this period of time um, is uh, the Chicana rights movement, which is, is occurring on a national level in, uh, in all kinds of ways from the, uh, the, the strikes of the great workers to the uh, formation of an organization here in Austin called the League of United Chicano Artists. And uh, the music of this time I think really reflects the tri-cultural environment of Texas, the Anglo, the African American, and the Mexican American. Because during the civil rights movement of the 60s and the 70s, the young Mexican Americans were also in search of their identity. In some ways, they were not Mexican enough in the eyes of older Mexicans, nor were they American enough for white stream white America. This is ironic because some of their parents were the same Pachuco kids who were experiencing that same sort of, of uh, rebellion in their younger days too. But as a result of this, uh, out of this comes the Chicano movement, and it, it's commonly called La Onda Chicana, the Chicano wave, or sometimes called Chicano soul. Uh, and this music is a hybrid of traditional Mexican music with R&B, soul, and rock and roll. And you'll see it, it, it starts to come out very publicly toward the end of the 60s and early 70s. Um, bands like Santana out of the, the West Coast or uh, El Chicano's song Viva Torado that was very popular on the charts back then, even here in the early 70s with War and Low Rider. Um, but in Texas, the bands like the Latin Breed were very uh, important bands. They were one of the biggest wants to come out of San Antonio, they had a trademark four-part harmony horn lines that just really distinguished them among the rest of them. You also continued to have bands like the West Side Horns, 
Um, there was another band called the uh, horn bass band out of San Antonio called the Dale Kings who left and went to the West Coast and then migrated into to Las Vegas. And what's interesting about that is among them was a one of the original West Side horn players named Cleto Escobedo Jr. And his son Cleto Escobedo the third is going to grow up with Jimmy Kimmel and will uh, be first call on Jimmy Kimmel's show when Jimmy puts together his horn band and Jimmy says, hey, I want to, I mean, uh, Cleto III says, hey, I want to bring my dad in. So he brings his dad in. So all of a sudden, every night when Jimmy Kimmel comes on and you see those two guys playing sax, they're playing the signature sound of San Antonio, which is twin saxophones. Yeah. So this is kind of a nice little turnaround. A lot of the players will stay there and find work. Some of them will be work within the, the um, industry. Cleto told me that for a long time he was a waiter there. You know, until the the music that he got popular playing and that drew him there became around again and allowed him to get out of the business of being a waiter and start playing music full time again. So, for people like him, you know, that was uh, yeah, he's really seen a lot in his career. But this, uh, uh, you know, there are also bands that are still hugely popular in that period of time. Uh, Sunny and the Sunliners, uh, the Royal Jesters are still keeping it up, and and they're they're, they're starting to adopt lots of more rock and roll into their more traditional Mexican sound. But maybe the most important Latin artist out of this era is Little Joe Hernandez. He, uh, his music really reflected the emerging political consciousness of, of dis disillusioned Chicano youth in a lot of ways. He, he's from Temple, Texas, and yet he, from a very early age, he tours all over Central Texas and South Texas, and so he developed a big following, first with a band called the Latin Airs, and in the Latin Airs, he, he be, begins to bring in his family. His brother Johnny Hernandez comes in to sing. Um, he, many, many players will come in and out of Little Joe's bands over the years uh, when they become uh, Eli, especially when they become Eli Familia. But one of the, the really interesting periods of, of the Latin airs, he has a singer named Paula Estrada with him. And if you go on YouTube, there's a great video of her singing Hello Stranger. And uh, it's just wonderful. She's beautiful and she's got a gorgeous voice and this is just wonderful slow dance music that kind of forgotten and marginalized in there. But she's an excellent example of the kind of, of uh, really huge effect that Lil Joe had by um, sticking with it all these years, too. Uh, Austin, uh, at the same time, is going to start developing very strong local acts like Shorty and the Corvettes, Manny and the CEOs, uh, Solomon and El Molino, and clubs like La Pol Polquita will continue to provide places that they can meet at, dance at, and that's a very important part of keeping up with, with, uh, with those bands, is the, the ability to hear them and uh, respond to them in, through dancing. Traditional established acts like the Ramos family are also still still very popular. Johnny De Gallardo, Manuel Cowboy Donnelly, and Nash Hernandez, and Lalo Guerrero are all still working at this period of time too. So that going into 1970 or going into the 70s, all of these genres of music existed also with very heavy political undertones nationally, and Austin is no different. Um, remember that, that that Texas is still coming out of the kind of double black eyes that it got from the Kennedy assassination and then from Whitman's trip up the tower in 1966, which is one of the first incidences of mass, uh, mass murder in the United States. Um, and the Lone Star State's uh, rather notorious uh, status was cemented in the 1969 film Easy Rider, and all of this was against the backdrop of the Vietnam War and the Nixon presidency. Yet the music that's being made in Texas is, is really powerful. Remember that right at the end of the 60s, you've got the, you know, on the, on the charts, hitting, hitting the top 40, you've got the elevators, you've got Sir Douglas, you've got Bubble Puppy, you've got the moving sidewalks, you've got Kenny Rogers, you've got people like Archie Bell and the Drill, you know. That, that poor guy, his song came out, he gets marched off to Vietnam, while his song is a hit all over the country, he's serving our country. So that by the time he comes back, he's off the charts, but you know, but he's got this <coughs> this kind of great little bit of fame behind him, and he carries it with him all his life. He still goes out there and tours these days. Um, Joe Tex is another one who's who's got a uh, national profile, uh, and uh, meanwhile, you have have all of this stuff that's bubbling under in Texas. I mentioned a band called Homer, who in 1969 does a 
a version of Willie Nelson's I Never Cared For You, they psychedelicize it, and they throw in a riff from Hall of the Mountain King, you know. I mean, who's thinking about that? San Antonio, but these guys are. And, and again, in 1969, you have to look uh, at what's coming into to the 70s, and one of the most important recordings that occurs then is um, by Frummix, and this is the Texas Trilogy, because uh, this too is going to, to set the scene for, for Cosmic Cowboys at that time, and I can just remember the, the undercurrent of, of talk about how important Texas Trilogy was because, uh, not only because it was these kind of unknown singer-songwriters who were, who were from Northeast Texas, but because it, it, it literally told the story in there, and this is something different, a different aspect that's being added into popular music at that time. So it's a new time for the sounds, the early 70s, and although bands from uh, the Birds to the Monkeys and to the Beatles have been recording country songs in the 60s, um, progressive, progressive country really has its roots, I think, its hard roots in the 50s since it rejects the country politan trend of the 60s. Um, and the popular terms that, that come about right then, progressive country, outlaw country, redneck rock, these are intended to be contradictory. They're intended to really separate out this sound from the country politan sound. And I believe that it's Austin's position as one of the homes of progressive country that, it's first, that is its first staking of the claim to the title of live music capital of the world. So um, as if to underscore that, in, on August 7th of 1970, the Armadillo World Headquarters opens. Um, it opens with the band Sheba's head, Headband, the Hub City Movers who are from Lubbock, and a local band called Whistler performing. Uh, the capacity of the Armadillo then was 1,500 patrons standing, but the chairs were pretty limited, so they usually sat on the floor. I mean, how many of us sat on those pieces of carpet that were soaked with so much beer? <laughs> but it was great in a way. You know, you sat on the floor there, and you were, you know, you were at one with everybody that was down there. Everybody was down on the floor. You know, the joints got passed and they just went down the aisle. You know, if you started it, you might not see it again. It might be three rows up before it gets put out or something. And, you know, sometimes people would just come in and buy, buy pitchers of beer for the whole aisle in there. So it really, uh, it was really quite amazing. It followed the legacy of the Vulcan Gas Company. It, it continues to keep Austin on the map as a, as a renowned musical destination, which Austin also hasn't always been. But I think that the, the Vulcan really kind of uh, posited it for that. But by booking everything from jazz to ballet to comedy to hard rock to punk, uh, the Armadillo manages to stay relevant during, during the entire 70s. And uh, not only that, but they book local, local acts with national acts on such a regular basis that it allowed Austin bands to expand their fan base then by developing relationships with these other bands that they could go to their town again. So that bands like the Uranium Savages were very friendly with the Ha Ha Vision Orchestra from, from Atlanta. Or um, when, uh, when local bands would come here, they would make sure and, and book such bands as Greasy Wheels or, or, or Balcones Fault, who were both enormously popular to make sure that they had a good crowd that night. That they were thought the headliner might not be up for it. Um, I think that, that that blend of country and rock music and that sort of atmosphere with a, a, the visual affirmation of these posters really creates a mystique that, that can't be duplicated and couldn't be faked. Um, I talked an awful lot about Janis Joplin in the last uh, in, the, in the 60s too because of of, of how her the arc of her career starts here in Austin when she, she gets the idea that she can actually sing and, and perform music in front of an audience through those Threadgill's open mic sessions. But, but 1970 is really a, a chaotic year for her. She, uh, first she disbands the Cosmic Blues Band. Uh, by April she, she uh, has the new Full Tilt Boogie Band in uh, their recording and, and recording stuff for the, the Pearl record. But in August 12th, she gives her last public performance with them, and on the 13th, she fl flies to Port Arthur, Texas, for her family reunion, or sorry, class reunion at uh, TJ High School, which you know must have been really interesting for her. You, you, we all know from history that she really went back there to go to everybody who, who ran me out of town, ran me out of the state. She said on, on Dick Cabot one time, but. Um, on her way back, uh, 
after August 14th, she stops in Austin for Kenneth Threadgill's birthday. And there's, there's great footage of, of her. Um, it's not actual footage of her. There's some, some uh, there's, it's not synced up with the, the audio that's on there, but there's some stuff that's on YouTube of, of her that's there. So uh, she goes back to California, and right at the beginning of September, she's, uh, she's still recording sessions for, for Pearl, Jimi Hendrix ODs. And so the rock and roll world is in shock. And just weeks later, on October the 4th, alone in her room at the Landmark Hotel at about 1.30 in the morning, she overdoses on heroin and dies. And you know, if you want to talk about uh, the end of the 60s, the, the loss of, of, of Brian Jones, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, and Janis Joplin in such close proximity in 69 and 70 really, I think, puts a big gravestone right there. You know? But in a sense, when that happens, as always, you know, the old saying, one door doesn't close without another opening. So um, it's, uh, you know, Janice, Janice is dead, but she's going to about to have her biggest success as a performer with the hit Me and Bobby McGee, who's written by Chris Christopherson. And once again, you get that arc that goes right back to Texas, because that's where Chris is from. Um, 1971 is also the year in which Doug Somm comes back to Texas. He's on the cover of Rolling Stone for the second time, another Baron Wallman shoot. And he records The Return of Doug Saldana. And this is kind of a statement of purpose recording of his, I believe, because he wants you to know that A, he's back in Texas, and B, he's back in San Antonio, and he's reclaiming his, his west side roots there. Um, but this isn't going to last very long because uh, he gets into a, a yet another legal dust up with the, the cops there, and he decides, I'm done with San Antonio, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to Austin. And so that's when he, he picks up and, and moves up here to Austin, although he spends a lot of time going back and forth. His family's in Converse at this period of time. So he's in San Antonio, he's in Converse, and he's in Austin, kind of ping-ponging around there a whole bunch. Uh, right the same, same year, uh, Michael Murphy resumes his as a singer-songwriter and signs to his first sorry signs his first solo recording contract with A and M Records and this first album Geronimo's Cadillac comes out in 1972. Um, it's quite a modest hit in its titled song, which was covered by a number of other people, including Floyd Axton, who's no slouch as a singer-songwriter himself. And it's also taken up as kind of an anthem by uh, some Native American tribes and civil rights act activists. So. Uh, Michael Murphy is really right there at the, the forefront of this, uh, this birth of this progressive country. In 1971 also, radio station KRMH signs on and uh, is better known to all of us as, anybody remember what they called it? Karma Radio. Mm -hmm. you know? And that was a suitable name for a progressive rock station and uh, that was on the fringe of Austin back then. And broadcasting from beautiful downtown Buda, it used to say. <laughs> it was actually licensed to um, the San Marcos Austin area, and was owned by a gentleman whose whose name was R. Miller Hicks, R. M. H. Hence K. R. M. H. On there. Um, same year, a small club opens at the corner of Eighth and Red River. There's not much there to suggest that this is a great area to open up, but uh, uh, Roger One Night and Gary Oliver and and uh, Rodney uh, I forget Rodney's last name. We'll all get together. And go. This is the place for us. They open up the one night there with a coffin-shaped door and, uh, and a great jukebox. But one of the things about the one night is that it becomes kind of the prototype for clubs like Soap Creek and, uh, and after that the Black Cat by its regular residencies. And uh, by about 1973 when I come to Austin, I hit the one night pretty much every night because on Monday night they've got Storm there, that's Jimmy Bond's band. On Tuesday night, they've got the Nightcrawlers, who's got a little kid named Stevie, Rip, Stevie Vaughn, not Stevie Ray, Stevie yeah. Vaughn playing guitar. Then they've also got Doyle Bramhall on drums and Keith Ferguson on bass. Uh, Wednesday night was Paul Ray and the Cobras. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Paul Ray and the Cobras. Wednesday night was Otis Lewis and the Cotton Kings. Um, Thursday night, they often had like Angela and the Rockets playing there or may, maybe uh, Lewis's band in there. And then who cares about what they had on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday <laughs> nights? I mean, that was great music that was just being played during the week there. No cover, 
They passed the hat for everybody there. But everybody was always pretty friendly and we usually kept the band in beer. So. Um, one of the reasons the one night works is because of uh, something I, I call the internal Texodus. Remember in the 60s I referred to the Texodus that occurs when, when uh, a lot of Austin's creative community kind of gets up and moves out to San Francisco and really when uh, they talk about Haight-Ashbury in the San Francisco era and stuff, so much of that comes out of Texas folks that it's ridiculous. But, um, but one of the benefits of being in a town uh, with a large university student po population is that it gets refreshed annually. But by 1970, by the early 70s, Austin's musical mystique is appealing to non-students and non-student musicians. And Austin has begun attracting groups of people to move there. Um, from Houston had come a Bill Narum and Carrie Fitzgerald, also known as Carrie On, and other folks from their very, very fertile music scene there. San Antonio gave up Doug Somp, Andy Salmon, Christopher Cross, Charlie Pritchard, Fletcher Clark, uh, practically running them out of town. Dallas had a particularly potent crew of young blues musicians who, with their girlfriends, wives, and children, all packed up and literally moved here within a year, year's period of time, not to go to school. Uh, among these musicians were Paul Ray, Jimmy Vaughn, Mark Pollock, Doyle Bramhall, Steve, uh, Stevie Vaughn, and Denny Freeman. They were not interested in country music. They weren't here for school. They were here to play music. About 1972, uh, Willie Nelson's had it. He's tired of Nashville and his house burns down. This is a good time to come back to Austin. Um, about this time, uh, the Lost Gonzo Band is uh, pulling itself together, playing gigs with Jerry Jeff at, at Castle Creek, and they have quite an interesting lineup then at that period of time, including uh, Michael McGarry, Herb Steiner, and um, Craig Hillis in the band. Gary, Gary P. Nunn was also one of the uh, chief leaders of the band, and uh, um, I don't know if Bob Livingston was in the band at that time or not. Was he, is he one of the original guys with, uh, with uh, Craig Hillis? And I cannot forget Bob Livingston. But uh, among the records that, that come out within a very short period of time between 72 and 73, um, you can kind of hold up, like I said, that from its Texas trilogy is, is one of the the seed records from it, but, but here comes Geronimo's Cadillac that we mentioned by uh, Michael Murphy, Jerry Jeff Walker's first record on MCA in, in 72. Uh, then along in 73 comes Cosmic Cowboy Souvenir by Michael Murphy, Viva Terlingua from Jerry Jeff Walker, uh, Michael Mar Murphy's uh, uh, 70, 73 record, after that, or maybe I'm repeating myself here, Rusty Weir, B.W. Stevenson, Willis Allen Ramsey, and Willie Nelson, but there, there are lots of other people out there too. There's uh, Milton Carroll is out there playing, Alan Damron, Jubal Clark, all kinds of folks who will, will really fill in on the scene. And then uh, you know you have your, your, your kind of older scenesters like Jesse Ashlock who played with, with uh, Bob Wilson to Texas Playboys, and he's still very much on the scene then. So uh, it's a very exciting time to do something like have what was known as the Dripping Springs Reunion in March of 1972. This is probably the, um, one of the most interesting music events of note in 1972. It's essentially the prototype for Willie Nelson's picnic. It's not run by Willie Nelson, however, although he, he plays at it. He really doesn't have anything to do with this, except he gets inspired by it. But, um, but Roy Acuff was really excited about it, which is interesting because you know this is the Nashville that, that is sort of being, um, um, rebelled against right now. So for Roy Acuff to sort of give this, this um, you know, thumbs up to what's happening was, was very cool. He says that this whole, whole, whole notion of, of this reunion can turn the entire country music industry completely around. And that he thought it had uh, more potential as an event than the Newport Jazz Festival, which uh, was probably the, the prototype death period for, for a very successful, lengthy uh, festival. But that reunion, uh, that Dripping Springs reunion, uh, attracted about 25,000 fans over three days. And uh, it, the lineup included Loretta Lynn, Bill Monroe, Hank Snow, the Light Crest Doughboys, Tom T. Hall, Chris Christopherson, Buck Owens, Roger Miller, and Tex Ritter, plus Willie and Waylon. And so you can see how, you know, the uh, the idea for the picnic would come out of something like that. They said that it was uh, a success in every way but financially. 
<laughs> also, though, that same year, another music event of note. This is the very first uh, Kerrville Folk Festival is held June 1st through 3rd in 1972. And it's held at the 1,200-seat Kerrville Municipal Auditorium. About 2,800 fans from all over Texas and as far away as Colorado come to it. Uh, there are 13 performers who were featured at this particular event. But these, um, uh, and, and this would become obviously, as, as you know, a, a regular event every year in spring, uh, uh, several different kinds of Kerrville events to happen. But these, these particular ones at the beginning were a direct outgrowth of those uh, festivals that I mentioned from the 60s, like the summer music festivals from KHFI, um, places like the checkered flag folk music scene on Lavaca, those uh, Longhorn Jazz Festivals that I mentioned, as well as the, uh, the live and recorded music of Austin folk artists that were done between the, the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. Um, these days, you know, it's a music festival that's held for days at a time, and uh, it's held out at Quiet Valley Ranch and just gets thousands of people in there now. But back then, 1,200 seats and 2,800 fans for the first year of Kerrville. Um, 1973, 1973, uh, the chief drive-in on North Lamar closed. <laughs> I find that to be very interesting because it was one of the last of the big drive-in theaters. And uh, uh, drive-in theaters had been kind of an interesting venue for rock and roll in its very early days when, when uh, teen movies would sometimes be consigned simply to the drive-in circuit and stuff like that. But, it was right there at the corner of, uh, of Caney Glane and, uh, and North Lamar, where there's, a, a, I think, Half Price Books is there now. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was a beautiful old theater. I had just moved to Austin. It was right across the street from where I was living. They had all of this stuff that was left in there. They just like left all of this, this movie material stuff in there. So there was actually old reels that were in there. And, and uh, they had all these magazines that were from Hollywood. With, telling you how to promote the movies and stuff like that. You know, how to scare girls and stuff like that. I mean, really, this is the kind of stuff they had. Fascinating to see. It doesn't have anything to do with music, but just something I remember about moving to Austin for the first time. What I do remember is that, is that there was a big hubbub happening because uh, Cleve Hattersley from Greasy Wheels had been busted, and he is sent off to prison on, a, on a charges, and he ends up doing 11 months on a, on a seven-year charge, so he actually got pretty lucky to get out there. But also that same year, 1973, Sub Creek Saloon opens. And um, it's, uh, it's outside the city limits, much like the old uh, country clubs used to be. Remember, uh, Skyline was up on Old Dallas Road, and uh, the uh, uh, Broken Spoke was outside the city limits. But uh, it had been known as Rolling Hills previously, right before then, and uh, would very shortly become home to people like Marsha Ball, Joe Ely, Alvin Crow. Paul Ray and the Cobras, uh, Doug Somm, the Uranium Savages, and Augie Myers, um, and uh, would end up lasting for about 23 years in several different locations. But as I mentioned earlier, like, um, like the one night, it sort of picked up the idea of having residency gigs there, too. Uh, one of the other important clubs uh, of that period of time is the Split Rail, down the corner of uh, Riverside and uh, South Lamar. Uh, it's sort of home to Freed and the Fire Dogs, who are one of the, the early bands who, who forms here in Austin, wanting to be one of these young country rebel bands. And so uh, Cooter Brown is another band that plays there very regularly. Uh, there's also Castle Creek, where Delbert and Glenn are regular players. Uh, Delbert and Glenn just put out a record this year. It's terrific. It is so great. I mean, I've always thought Delbert was fantastic. Um, I kind of was a little late to the Delbert and Glenn stuff, but if you know, if you're looking for a good record that's old stuff that we like, that Delbert and Glenn record is as good as anything you can find out there. So if you're looking for something for yourself for for this year, I really recommend that. Um, the Armadillo had had been going uh, pretty strong in its first few years as a concert venue, but in 1973 it adds a beer garden, and this really uh, serves to to further make it sort of the, the home base for the counterculture in Austin. And I mean, just the amount of bands that are playing there just at this period of time are, are really incredible. I mean, lo local bands are She Was Headband, Storm, Michael Murphy, Cracker Jack, Greasy Wheels, DK Little, <coughs> Too Smooth, Kinky Friedman, The Electromagnets, Fools, Alvin Crow, Sleep at the Wheel, Mother of Pearl, 
Dana, Man Mountain, Green Slime Boys, Whistler, Willie Nelson, Los Gonzo Band, Stephen Fromholtz, Robert Shaw, St. Elmo's Fire, James Polk, Starcross, 47 Times It's On Way, Doug Somm, national acts that are coming through right in that period of time, uh, Bruce Springsteen, a young up-and-coming musician, uh, the Pointer Sisters, Mance Lipscomb, Elvin Bishop, Chuck Mangione, Sean Phillips, Hall and Oates, The Mighty Clouds of Joy, Charlie Daniels, Joy of Cooking, Barney Kessel, Little Feet, Freddie King, Diodato, Leo Kotke, Frank Zappa, Commander Cody, New Writers of the Purple Sage, Tracy Nelson, Drake Bromberg, Loudon Wainwright, The Incredible String Band, Taj Mahal, Ted Nugent, Charlie Mingus, Eddie Harris, Stanley Clark, Papa John Creech, Graham Parsons. You get the idea. You know, this is really powerful stuff being bring brought to Austin on a weekly basis. And I mean, you know, you could go to the Armadillo two or three times, two or three times a week and see completely different kinds of acts there. And so this is really serving to bring lots of attention to Austin because these bands are having a good time when they come here. You know, they're enjoying it. I mean, you know, you go into walk in the arm dealer practically the first thing they do is stick a joint in your mouth and light it for you. You know, these bands go back to, to, to England, they go back to Indiana, they go back to California and New York and Chicago and they take the message of, of this with them. So, you know, the legend of Austin begins to grow because of this. Um, was there a picnic that year? Yes, as a matter of fact. It's actually kind of what is the, the first one. It happens in Dripping Springs. Uh, Willie didn't seem to mind that the, the uh, Dripping Springs reunion that had happened the year before was a financial failure. He wanted his, uh, his own outdoor festival and settled on the 4th of July. So uh, he, he goes back out to, to Dripping Springs Ranch because he, he likes the... Uh, the setting out there, and this time he brings about 40,000 hippies and rednecks and the rest of the Willie crowd with him. And once again, in the fine tradition, it loses money, but it begins a uh, Texas tradition. The lineup that year included Waylon Jennings, Chris Christopherson, John Prime, Doug Somm, and Tom T. Hall, um, and was uh, described by Billy Porterfield as being both uh, miserable and great in one of the great glorious heathen stomps. So that's the uh, that's the beginning of of, of Willie's Willie's picnics there in, uh, in 1973. Uh, there's still stuff going on in, in other genres of music around town. You see the beginning of, of Ruben Ramos and the Mexican Revolution. He's pay, he's been paying attention to what's been going on in Chicano rock too, but he really comes more from the old school orchestra style. So he likes to to have the really good slick band leader look, and that's the look that he chooses to keep. Uh, meanwhile, you've got folks like James Polk and the Brothers who are, who are still doing some fine funk recordings for local, local acts around that time, and you can con certainly contrast that to somebody like Kinky Friedman's career, who's, uh, who's busy putting out records like uh, Get Your Buns in Bed, biscuits in, biscuits in the Oven and Buns in the Bed, um, and Asshole from El Paso. <laughs> So, uh, uh, you know, there are lots of people who are keeping things very politically incorrect as well as breaking the boundaries out there. I think that probably, for, for me anyway, 1973, the, the most important uh, musical thing that happens is the release of Doug Somm and Friends on Atlantic Records. I, this is arguably Doug Somm's finest hour because although progressive country is catching up, he's really still ahead of the curve here. Um, Atlantic Records was paying a lot of attention to Austin music, but, but uh, what Doug, Doug assembles for this particular record is uh, kind of the forerunner of the Texas Tornadoes here, 15 years before they actually happened. The record features uh, Bob Dylan, Dr. John, and Pat Head Newman on there, but it also features Flaco Imanes on there. Flaco was born in San Antonio in 1939 and raised in a, a musical family that dated back several generations. His, grandfather was playing the precursor of Cucunto on, on accordion, and his, his father, uh, Santiago, was a pioneer Tex-Mex musician who cuts one of the first Cucunto records. His brother, uh, Santiago, also carries on the tradition. So we're beginning to kind of see a resurgence in, in accordion music as a, as a popular instrument in Texas. <coughs> and really, no one uh, really carries this 
accordion to people tex mex sound to, to more people in places I think than, than Guaco does. I mean, he introduces the kind of traditional conjunto sound to mainstream pop and listeners uh, later on through his work, not only with the Texas Tornadoes, but with Dwight Yoakam and the Mavericks and, and other folks. And, and he's still like one of the first to call um, uh, accordion players. And if they can't find him, a lot of times they'll call uh, Augie Myers these days, too, because he certainly carries that sound on, too. But but Flacco is, is, is really uh, celebrated. I mean, people like Ry Cooter and Carlos Santana and the Rolling Stones call him to come do recordings with them. And he inspires other Maverick accordion players like Ibe Barra and uh, especially uh, Esteban Jordan, who is inspired by Flacco, but goes in a whole complete di different direction himself. He's much more influenced by rock and roll than anything else. And as a matter of fact, uh, Esteban Jordan will become kind of known as the Jimi Hendrix of rock and roll. He, was, he had one eye and he used to wear a patch. He used to do a whole lot of acid. Sometimes when he'd get really ripped on acid playing, to rip that patch off to smear people. <laughs> he'd be much more of the empire like, like, like the guy on there. Um, <laughs> So 1974, you know, we are really in the throes of, 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 of Cosmic Cowboy stuff, especially because uh, since Michael Murphy's album Cosmic Cowboy Souvenir comes along, it provides us with, with yet another term to throw into outlaw country and redneck rock and progressive country, and that's Cosmic Cowboy. And that's kind of the one that, that uh, is probably used the most in, in, in a deprecating manner, too, because, uh, you know, I think that at some point it really would become... Um, sort of hackneyed um, and certainly at least lost lost a lot of its punch by by the mid-70s but it's still going quite strong in, in 1974. Um, Rolling Stone gets hit to it and man, I'm not making, making fun of them. Rolling Stone's been keeping their eyes on Texas for a long time. Remember they put Doug Sam on the cover twice already but in 74 they said Chet Flippo down here and Chet Flippo's a Texan and he, he loves this stuff so he reports back to Rolling Stone in a story in April 74 that, you know, that Austin is, is, is the place for all of this music to be. And he goes on at length about all of the, the bands that are playing progressive country music down here in, in Austin and why this is such a great place to be. But um, a woman named Shirley Radisso takes issue with that. And I talked about Shirley in um, a couple of, in the, I think in the first class, because uh, she was the one who as a little girl Robert Johnson sought refuge after his San Antonio uh, sessions uh, with her family down at the integrated fishing camp that they had down on the Texas coast and uh, believes that the guitar that Lightning Hopkins brought down for him, sorry, not Lightning Hopkins, T-Bone Walker, brought down for him is the one that he's playing. It may be conjecture, but this is Shirley's memory of, of all of this. But Shirley uh, uh, has continued to, uh, to sing with uh, uh, Right, uh, uh, racially integrated bands through her, her big band era and then into blues. But she kind of retires from it in the, the, by the 60s and is writing full time. But by the, the early 70s, she's interested in uh, what she sees going on around town because uh, she feels like she has a good ear for music. And so when she sees some of these young guitarists playing blues, she becomes very supportive of them and starts managing a, a, a blues band here called Blue Norther featuring Mark Pollock on guitar. Um, and she takes issue with this article in Rolling Stone and, and so she shoots back a letter to Rolling Stone called, and, they t and they print it and it's titled In Defense of Austin Blues. And the letter reads, Chet Flippo's Austin the Hucksters are coming, failed to mention that Austin boasts the finest blues and rhythm, rhythm and blues guitarists anywhere. Jimmy and Stevie Vaughan, Mark Pollock, Denny Freeman, W.C. Clark, and Matthew Robinson have such talent it is beyond words. It may be that, as your article phrases it, Austin's claim to national prominence has come to be a center of a musical movement usually referred to as progressive country. But maybe what we need is some high-grade hucksters who can see the entire picture here. It's true that progressive country is on records, and most of the bluesmen are so broke that a pickpocket going through their pockets would get nothing but practice. <laughs> so don't ignore the other half of Austin's music. It makes us feel as unwanted as those for whom Bert Williams sang, 
Come after breakfast, bring along lunch, and leave before supper time. Shirley R. Dimmick, Austin, Texas. Well, that's a pretty, I mean, that's a pretty brave statement, you know. Shirley's standing up to, to Rolling Stone, and she's going, hey, there's, there's more going on here than, than what you think. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you what it is. And she does. I like the way she says that. Unfortunately, Sir Shirley leaves town that year. And she decides to move out to California where her kids are. And that's where she's going to stay for the rest of her life. She just died in uh, March of this year. And, uh, and boy, as I said, she took some of her stories with her. And it's really too bad because uh, she knew some of the history of Texas music that's, that's absolutely irreplaceable. 1974, you see the first issue of the Austin Sun published. Um, the RAG is still publishing at this period of time. So, so you, once again, you have, have uh, two alternative uh, press publications in town against the, uh, uh, state, the Statesman and the American, which I think have joined as one paper by this point, or they are right now period of time, and also the Austin Citizen I mentioned. But, but the Statesman uh, has finally figured out it needs to get hip, so they hire a, a, uh, a stockbroker to write their music columns. And that sounds fun, but Townsend Miller actually really knew his stuff. And Townsend Miller and Shirley Radisseau, as a matter of fact, went way back to the 50s when they all used to write for one of the Texas Park and Wildlife uh, Department publications, and that's how they got to know each other. And they were they were fans of the of the music scene and uh, used to uh, trade stories about it. So uh, even though Townsend Miller was yes a stock stockbroker by trade, he, he he knew his stuff about music and and certainly was as good a person as any to tell him what was going on. Before that, there had been a gentleman named Jim Langston who used to write about music in the the '60s in in Austin paper, and that's where some of your earliest mentions of. Uh, like the Elevators and the New Orleans Club and Janis Joplin are, because interestingly, Jim Langston is from Port Arthur. He went to school with Janis there. He and Dave Moriarty, and he's part of the crew that, that runs out of Port Arthur as fast as they can and, and comes to, uh, to Austin. Uh, also in uh, 1974 is uh, the publication of The Improbable Rise of Redneck Rock by Jan Lee. And uh, this is, the, again, one of the, the first statements uh, in publication of the movement that's been happening here in Austin. So, um, despite what Shirley says in, in Rolling Stone, you know, country music is, is really dominating the scene here right now. And the improbable rise of, of redneck rock is, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to read it now, I think. I was just talking with, with, with Melissa about it because she's got a, a copy of it that she's reading, and it really serves very much as a period piece. Jan was a young writer then, and the writing reads a little clumsily sometimes, um, but look past the style for it and for the information that he's giving there, the people that he's talking about, the places they're playing, what they're saying. They're, they're all young here. They're, they're <coughs> very young and kind of experiencing their first, first time in the spotlight. So, you know, you hear people like Rusty Weir, who, who grew up here in Austin, playing music, and his family owned a, a restaurant down on Congress. Um, you hear him talking for the first time about you know, what it's like to, to come into the scene and everything. So that's really the value of that book. And um, I really do recommend it, even though, as I say, it, it, you know, it reads a little, a little choppy. What's the author's name? Jan Reed, R-E-I-D. -E I don't know if you all remember about 15 years ago, so there was an interesting incident in which it, uh, some Texas Monthly writers went down to Mexico and uh, they were just out to have a good time and got in a taxi cab and <coughs> taken to a part of town they didn't know and, and uh, all of a sudden a car pulls up alongside them and holds a gun out of them and they all get out of the taxi and something bad happens and Dan Reed gets shot. And he survives the, the, the shooting, but he, he still walks around on a, on a cane now. And it was, they never found anything out about that. It was, they said it was the cops who were stopping them, but you know, who knows what happened really. It was, what year was that? Star. I'm trying to remember when that was. I was still working in the Chronicle offices, so it was, the, it was, um, it must have been around the mid 
mid mid nineties or so. Mm -hmm. But I remember that Mark Mike Hall from right, cool. Texas Monthly was on was on that yeah, venture with them and, and wrote about it afterward. There's a book called The Bullet Meant for Me. That That's right. Yeah. Jan wrote a book about that. Yeah, he did. Um, he also just wrote a book a, a couple of years ago about Ann Richards that I'm a little reading, just fascinated by it. Actually, just about a year ago. Yeah, I, I just, I, you know, it, it's funny how reading that book about Ann Richards, how much I was learning about the music scene too, mm -hmm. from the political point of view. You know, that there were all these politicals who called themselves the Mad Dogs, who, who were like really supportive of all this upcoming country. And I mean, they were snorting coke and smoking joints along with everybody else there, Ann Richards included. You know, and she never did really deny it, and that was kind of part of a, of a little PR problem she had there for a while. But, uh, <laughs> was also one of the original investors in the Armadillo. That's right, but yeah. But Drake put $1,500 into that's it. That's right. You know, that's, a, that's such an interesting story about <laughs> all that, because um, depending on who you talk to, <laughs> what story you get about the starting of the Armadillo. In 1974, also, Billboard, magazine names KOKE as the most innovative radio station in the country. And uh, I think that one of the primary people that was responsible for that designation was a gentleman named Joe Gracie. He ambled into the brave new world of progressive country on, on Coke FM and he helped establish Austin Radio as being about Austin music. And that's one of the things that he really does and really reinforces in all of his years that he's at Coke FM and he's there pretty much until till the last day. We got photos of him and Alvin Crow at the KOKE um, desk, the very last broadcast there. But that the notion that, that, that local radio shouldn't be about local music was kind of an old-fashioned notion at the period of time, which is interesting because back in the, the 50s and, and 60s it was very much about regional and local radio. But um, uh, to Coke FN and, and, and to people like Joe, this meant you didn't just play Hank Williams' version of Love, Love Sick Blues, but you played Linda Ronstadt's too. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is this is really revolutionary to be able to hear this, these kinds of music being played play together. He's playing lots of Willie. He's playing lots of Whalen. He's playing lots of Willie and Whalen. Yeah. Um, uh, you got Rusty Weir singing "Don't It Make You Want to Dance." So you have these kind of anthems that are being written about uh, Austin. Um, the Gonzos were singing about nights that never got lonely, and and uh, it really KOKE I think was the soundtrack for for Austin at that period of time. Um, and he was such a character on the air too. I mean, he just you know there weren't any rules as far as Joe Gracie was concerned. If he liked the Lowell Leverman Lincoln Mercury uh, commercial, he'd sing along with it. You know, when it, when it was playing. <laughs> And sometimes you could hear him crooning, and I think that there's some tape of this, uh, of him doing it, that's it's available out there too. Um, Willie Nelson has a big year in 1974. He's got phases and stages coming out. He's got picnic number two in, in uh, College Station on July the 4th, and so for three days fa fans bake in this treeless <coughs> field out there at the, at the Texas World Speedway just south of, of College Station. Um, the, the, they were expecting about 50,000 people out there for it. They got about 25,000 people out there for it. But what it's really famous for was a bunch of cars burned out in the parking lot there. And among the cars that, that got burned was one that very famously belonged to Robert Earl Keane. And he still tells that story uh, at, at the drop of a hat. And, um, and if you haven't heard it, next time he's playing, just, just yell it out. He'll probably <laughs> tell it for you. Um, the lineup for that included Jimmy Buffett, Towns Van Zandt, and, and Kiki Friedman. But even though Willie has a, has a successful second um, uh, picnic, I think that the, the musical event of, of 1974 is ZZ Top's first Romp and Stomp and Barn Dance and Barbecue. It's held September 1st in Memorial Stadium, <laughs> of all places. It only features four acts. It features ZZ Top, Joe Cocker, Santana, and Bad Company. Um, Bill Narum drew the poster for it. Remember our Bill Narum theory of Austin? And he's, uh, he's just getting up now with his old buddies from Houston, and, and they've asked him to start drawing album covers for him, so he draws the poster for it. Um, it was, it was uh, Bad Company, ZZ Top, and 
um, Joe Cocker and Santana. And uh, one of the things that, that makes this particular event, I think, uh, a broader based event than, than Willie's Picnic that year is that they made sure to sell tickets to this show in every part of Texas. And you can see on the, the poster for it that, that, they, that uh, is still, uh, can be easily found on, on the internet, uh, that, that, that you can buy tickets in El Paso. You can buy tickets in Lubbock. You can buy them in Houston and in Corpus. You know, it's not just Austin. They were clearly making an effort of doing it. And it's not a, a bunch of, uh, you know, money grubbing promoters. This is, this is Naram and the crowd who put, put this event together. So they're really trying to, to be anti-corporate about this and yet at the same time um, uh, drawn as much as Texas as possible for it. Um, I think that another thing is that significant about it is that it uses Austin as a meeting place for all those parts of Texas by appealing to all of them and asking them to come here and do it. And that reinforces the notion of, of the music community being here in Austin. Unfortunately, the bar and dance isn't going to happen again. Where is the Morgan Stadium? Or right, 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 up, right here in the UT campus. It's, oh. it's right, right, right down the block there. And, and you know, the idea that they would have allowed all those hippies to go in there at that, that period of yeah. time is really kind of unthinkable. And why it doesn't happen again. <laughs> Um, in, in 1974, also, Austin appears for the second time in, in Rolling Stone, but this, this time the uh, article is by Gary Cartwright, who's a Texas Monthly writer. He's Bud Shrake's best buddy and one of the mad dogs, hangs out with Dan Richards a lot. The name of the article is Dope, Death, and Dirty Dealing in Texas. And it's, um, it addresses a series of, of murders that had happened anywhere around Texas. Uh, and, and pretty, pretty vile stuff, actually. The, um, this young, young dope dealer down in, uh, um, down by Buda was, uh, was, was murdered quite, quite horribly. Um, his, his penis was cut off and cut pieces and laid on the side of the tub. And, you know, it, these days, it would all be cartel stuff, you know, but this, you know, I don't even know if they ever solved that particular murder. It was particularly ugly, but it but it had a lot. It says a lot about what was going on in Austin then too. There was a lot of dope dealing in Austin. There was tons of dope dealing in Austin. Um, San Antonio had had been like kind of the the stopping point for for it for a long time, um, particularly for heroin and marijuana. But but in in the the seventies when when cocaine becomes very popular and it comes into the picture and things just get uglier and uglier. So um, this article by Gary Cartwright really, really details what a kind of a, an unpleasant undercurrent has occurred here in Austin because of it. What was uh, Ann Richards' political office then? What was she an attorney? Land commissioner? Or, or, or sorry, sorry. Uh, county commissioner. County commissioner. And then she becomes uh, uh, state treasurer after that. And that's... That's you know, but she also does lots of um, stuff for other campaigns too. So she learns a lot of, of the ins and outs of it by by running other people's campaigns before she starts running for office. And even after she does that, that she she does a lot of of consultation. So she's a pretty smart cookie about mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. Um, the Ritz opened uh, reopened that year in uh, 1974 as a music venue and has a kind of very much an armadillo feel to it. Uh, Jim Franklin does the posters for it. They bring in a lot of uh, really the old school blues play players like uh, Bucka White, uh, Jimmy Fastfingers, Dawkins, and the Meters. But uh, but you know but here, here at 74 and you got live music on Sixth Street, which is is not very friendly, friendly to live music at the time. In, in other words, not that it's not a friendly place. It's just there's not much going on. It pretty much shuts down at five o'clock downtown. And so uh, good luck getting your friends down there. Um, the same year, Freddie Fender records before the next Teardrop Falls with lots of encouragement from Doug Som. Um, the single was selected for national distribution and became a number one hit on the Billboard uh, Country and Pop charts. It sells over a million copies, was awarded a gold disc, and um, also his next three singles, Secret Love, You'll Lose a Good Thing, and a remake of Wasted Days and Wasted Nights, all go to number one on the Billboard Country charts. This is great news for somebody that's been a little while in prison before there. But, but uh, 
you know, you really got to give a lot of credit, I think, to Doug Song, who was always watching out for the people who influenced him. Mm -hmm. uh, J.R. Chatwell was a fiddler that he, he mm -hmm. brought along and played with uh, a lot of that period of time. Uh, he, he'll bring, he'll go in and haul Spot Barnett out of the, the background again in San Antonio and, and bring him up. But, but right now uh, he, he's focused on Fr Freddie Fender and he really is one of the reasons that, that Freddie gets his career back again. They very famously do a show at the Armadillo that has a, has a poster that's one of my favorite all-time posters. It's got Doug Sopp sitting in the back of a car with a girl and, there, and there's like a, a hula girl hood ornament that you can see there and then Freddie Fender is reflected in the, in the back of the, of the hood of the car. So it's, uh, it's, it was quite, quite an image. Um, that, was, that was the year that also Rusty Weir's Don't It Make You Want to Dance came out. Um, and uh, before you take a, a little break here for class, um, when, when Rusty died a couple of years ago, I, I wrote something about, about his death because uh, I really, really, really loved Rusty. Rusty could tell stories and stories about Austin and White that really nobody else could, just partly because he was a great storyteller and partly because he'd really seen it all. I mean, he, he, when he was 11, 12 years old, he had the drum kit. His parents used to drive him to gigs where he could play with his, his bands and stuff like that. So he really knew that stuff. But, um, uh, this was a letter that came to, to the Chronicle after, after my, my, my open on Rusty. They wanted to, to really correct the record on this. Um, Rusty Weir did not join Gary P. Nunn's Lavender, Expre Lavender Hill Express. The Lavender Hill Express was formed as a super group featuring the best guys from many other top local groups in Austin. Leonard Arnold from Felicity, who also featured Don Henley, Jess Yarian and Rusty Weir from the Wig, plus Leighton DePenning from Baby Cakes were all original members of the Lavender Hill Express. Gary P. Nunn was not even in the Lavender Hill Express originally. The original keyboardist was Johnny Schwartner. The group was a year into its tenure before Gary came on the scene. It was Rusty Weir's Lavender Hill Express from the get-go. Rusty Weir was an Austin icon. He had the first major label contract ever awarded to an Austin artist. Um, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. That's that's something that you can kind of argue about. But but he was probably the first person of his generation, maybe to to, to get one. He's the first person in Austin to stand out from the crowd of players and bands. Remember, this is part of the letter that's being written. This is not what I'm writing. Mm -hmm. He was the first to be recognized as an individual, <coughs> even as a drummer. Rusty Weir and the Wig held the number one slot with their two-sided single "Drive It Home," to have never loved at all. For several weeks in 1967 on KNOW, the only radio station in town that played popular music with groups like the Beatles. So I was taken to task for is having Tommy. Tommy. Hmm? I'm sure it is. I don't I have it in here. That's got to be Tommy Taylor. Tommy. Yeah, because Tommy's always the one who calls me down on, mm, on, yeah. on these little yeah. things. But he was right, you know, and he was right to say that. And, you know, when you're putting together th these histories, it's sometimes very easy to gloss over the, the order in which these things happen. And yet sometimes the order in which they happen is very crucial. And uh, we'll see some of that more um, when we start 1975 after this next break. So let's take about a 10 minute break and I'll see you all back here at uh, 8.15. And then uh, at about uh, 9 o'clock we'll take another few minutes and then we're going to look at some videos. That's why I'm not looking at videos this time during that. Uh, during class because we've got time to look at it again. Let's pick up in 1975 when the one night closes. Yeah. Um, Willie, was there a picnic this year? Oh yeah, Willie has one in uh, Liberty Hill uh, on July the 4th this year, but uh, uh, this one is a little different from the others. The townspeople don't like it very much. They really weren't prepared for, for the 70,000 or so people who showed up um, in uh, Liberty Hill to uh, uh, listen to Willie, and uh, uh, 70,000, it, it says. Uh, so where's Willie in this period of time? Well, he, he actually brings the picnic back to Austin now. It's at the Opera House this year. We're not going to have it outdoors anymore. Everybody's gotten a little, little much of that. Um, and. Uh, 
but he also plays a July 2nd show in, at the Texas Jam in Dallas. Does anybody remember that? They had two X's in Texas because there weren't enough X's already. Um, and uh, then he plays a July 1st show right before that in Kansas City. So he has a couple leading up to, to these uh, picnics that he does in, in the Opera House. And everybody really seems to be very grateful for this, for the shade this year. Um, it, uh, w it, was, it was much smaller because of, of the Opera House, but he didn't like it very much. And so uh, he, uh, he says that it's too controlled. I liked it better when it's out in the pasture. The lineup that year included the Grateful Dead. But, um, but the next thing that's going to happen, and I think uh, we can call this sort of the, uh, the musical event of, of 1978, uh, uh, is in September. And uh, school's back in session in UT. And um, there's a gig at, at Raoul's uh, fe featuring um, a uh, rhythm and blues band opening called uh, Cold Sweat and a bunch of uh, UT communication students call, call themselves the Huns. And um, this is, uh, this show is very interesting. It's gotten the attention of the police department who managed to seed the audience with undercover cops because the rumor is that, that you know, something dangerous is going to happen here, here that night. And so uh, uh, what happens is that the Huns are, are and, and there, I, there's a witness to this event. I was not there, but there is a witness in this room, so please correct me if, if I get this out of. <laughs> Steve played in Cold Sweat, who opened up for the Huns. So, so that, that's his uh, real claim to fame for knowing what went on that night. Um, and he does know it because Phil Colstead was on stage when one of the when a cop in uniform, Steve Bridgewater, walks in, and he points to the cop and starts screaming at him, "Eat death, scum!" Leading the audience into to chanting against the cops, and and the cop's not sure what to do, and he approaches Phil Colstead, the lead singer, who then proceeds to try to kiss him, and the cop doesn't like this, so. So he proceeds to try to grab Phil and, and arrest Phil, and then the uh, undercover cops jump out of the audience and rush the stage, and they're undercover. So the audience doesn't really know this, and they think that this is, you know, licensed to jump up and riot too. So you know, literally, the little little riot occurs, and uh, people get get uh, handcuffed and marched outside and laid, laid down on the sidewalk face down, including uh, my, my, well, he was a writer then for the Daily Texan, but he soon would be my editor, Nick Barbaro, and founder of South by Southwest. <laughs> um, there are other notable people who were, who were arrested in, in, in the scene in that period of time. Somebody actually gets, arrest, gets himself arrested at the police station. Um, and so, uh, so this incident, I mean, just explodes onto not only the headlines of the local newspapers, but most of the other newspapers in Texas and in Rolling Stone. So suddenly, you know, the paper that's been covering us as the home of progressive country, blah, 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 and, you know, somebody else is going, no, 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 blues down here, but it's all about punk now. And so, you know, this really is the, the event that, that puts Austin punk on the map and really reminds, uh, uh, really puts us back, puts Austin music back on the map too and in, in the, in front of everybody's attention. Boy, I don't think you could, uh, yes, Steve. <laughs> the only thing I would add to that is that uh, Steve Bridgewater, the arresting officer, was well acquainted with the members of the hunt uh, and he had actually appeared as a cop in a movie called The Death of Jim Morrison, which was a much valued, but maybe a module one. I haven't seen it a long time. Uh, uh, movie that uh, Tom Huckabee made, who was the drummer in the Huns. So they all knew each other. So when Bridgewater came into the club and, and they did this whole theater thing, of, so it seemed of, of him coming in and challenging Tolstoy and then Tolstoy kissing him, it just sort of seemed like they were just goofing around. 
and then there were a million cops and a lot of people being arrested. But 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 Bridgewater, the the, the actual cop who starts the whole thing, and Phil Tolstoy, the singer, knew each other very well. He was a street cop. That is interesting. And pretty much everything got thrown out of court. Yeah. You know, I don't think anybody. That's like, a whole other story. No, nobody does any real time. time <laughs> or um, so. Uh, there are some other things happening around Austin, though, too, too that, that year. A battle with throat cancer left Joe Gracie without his voice, and he had been literally uh, on Coke FM as, as the voice of radio. I said, as I said, you know, he really is one of the people who is responsible for uh, making Austin radio about Austin music again. Uh, but even though he doesn't have his voice, he and Bobby Earl Smith run uh, Electric Gracie Land Studios, and they took an interest in a lot of bands and, and produced them around town with varying degrees of success. Um, you're also finding that the, uh, the singer-songwriters are going big guns around this time, To uh, The Alamo Lounge is, is around. It's going to be closing very soon, though, and the Majos will open up. The Chicago House will open up. Cactus Cafe, you've got the Curvo Folk Festival and all those competitions that are really encouraging uh, people like Towns Van Zandt, Lyle Lovett, Nancy Griffith, Joe Ely, Jimmy Gilmore, and he wasn't Dale then, he was just Jimmy Gilmore, uh, Lucinda Williams, Robert Earl Keane, uh, Butch Hancock, and Blaze Foley, and, and, and it's really encouraging these folks uh, to, to uh, you know, to continue to pursue their careers. Uh, also, after bouncing around between here and Nashville, Uncle Walt's band permanently decides to make Austin their home. They're not by any means the first out-of-state band to come here, but their move is going to turn out to be really significant in a short period of time. Um, and I'll come back to that um, next week because that's when it becomes significant. Uh, also that year, um, Bill Bentley starts a, a show on KUT called Twine Time. And uh, it's going to be picked up later on by, by Paul Ray, who will take over when Bill moves out to L.A. Uh, but at that same, the same period of time, KLBJ will not play anything that's deemed to be punk or, or new wave. I mean, they literally won't play anything. Even the most innocuous kind of music being made then, like by the B-52s, they will not play. And I say the B-52s because when they do decide to play it, the very first punk new wave song they play is Planet Claire by... by uh, B-52s. But if you want to pick a point at which Austin music is, is coming together, I think 1978 is as good a year as, as any. Um, I mean, because things begin to change real dramatically again in 1979. And that, in that year, both Antones and Sub Creek move out of, out of their locations and, and relocate to, to different places. Antones goes to uh, north side of town, and so does, uh, so does Sub Creek. They go to the Sky, old Skyline Club. Um, and it's helpful too to remember that, that uh, in uh, 1969, these, are, these scenes are not necessarily uh, simpatico. I mean, people didn't necessarily jump from one scene to another. By the 2000s, you see Clifford Anton hanging out at the Broken Spoke all the time. But that wasn't happening in the 70s. I mean, I don't think Clifford Anton would have set foot in the Broken Spoke, and I don't think James White would have set foot in Anton's. Uh, nothing against each other, but everybody just kind of had their own turf, turf then. Um, but, you know, and in 1969, a long hair might get chased down the street by a bunch of rednecks in a pickup wanting to beat him up for the length of his hair, but in 1979, a punk might get chased down Guadalupe for, by a bunch of frat boys for having short hair, you know, so some things don't change down there. But it, by the end of the 70s, I think it's really fair to say that the Austin music has really been upended by punk music. It creates a similar sea change in Austin to the effect that the Beatles had on music in 64. It smolders slowly on the, in a West Campus club, but, but uh, explodes fully formed. Um, punk is a hybrid sound that uh, has its roots as much in, in garage rock as in, um, I think, British glam, and yet it, it bears an uneasy uh, relationship to disco. Um, within punk schisms are already uh, emerging between uh, nascent hardcore and uh, pop-flavored new wave stuff. Um, but the other genre of music that, that's experiencing a renaissance at the same time here in Austin is, is blues, and that has is a result of that internal texidus that I talked about of, of Dallas-Fort Worth musicians who came down here in the early 70s. Um, uh, 
<coughs> and, uh, and and once again, you know, if you want to know what's going on with 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 Willie's with his picnic, it happens at the newly purchased Pernalis Country Club this year. They get about 25,000 people, and uh, finally, all of the services are adequate. They figured out how they're going to do it, and. Um, the emergency services even include helicopter flights to Bracken Ridge. They had enough porta cans to, to take care of everybody. Willie's an entertainer. He's not in the porta can business. They kept saying, but they finally <laughs> figured all this out. Um, Ernest Tubb plays that year. Johnny Paycheck plays at it, and, and they're smart enough to have a nurse there at the um, at the station, at the emergency station on site for anybody being airlifted to the hospital, and she'll she'll tell them. There are police in the emergency room at Brackenridge. If there's anything you want to leave, leave it with me now. <laughs> um, but it, but I'm not really sure if, if that is if that's the most significant musical event of 1979. I think that the most significant musical event of 1979 occurs the very last year of um, December 31st because the Armadillo World Headquarters closes its doors forever, and uh, and that I think. In, by any definition and in the truest sense of the words was the end of 70s in Austin music. So next week we're going to start up uh, with the, we'll start by talking about the biggest band of Austin in 1980 who never played the Armadillo, Soap Creek, One Night Rowls or Antones and yet ranks as probably the most successful band out of Austin ever. Well, I'll tell you then when we come to them next week. Um, let's take just a, a couple of minutes here and then uh, Let's run this. Will you come up and talk with me? Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, to to invite uh, one of our, our our students up. This is a, an old friend of mine, Tim Hamlin, and uh, he works at the Austin History Center. And uh, we have been through a number of decades of this music together. And, and uh, Tim actually worked as my security, private security person for many years at the Music Awards. So, so, uh, so we, we have a very good relationship and, and, and have witnessed a lot of interesting music along the way. So Tim, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself and then what we're going to see here. Okay. Um, I uh, first found out about, I'm, first of all, I'm a video actress at the Austin History Center, which is at 8 Penn Guadalupe. You should all come and visit us if you haven't been there already. Um, I first, uh, the reason I came to Austin was because a friend, I was working in the uh, West Indies in a small island of Dominica, and a friend of mine uh, turned me on to some tapes from Austin Music of Joe Ely, Beethoven, Los Valens, Joe King Crasco, and various other artists, and I turned him on to The Clash and Sex Pistols. And so he said, well, if you ever come to the States, come and visit. So I did, and unfortunately I'm still here for this people who hate the uh, immigrants, <laughs> but uh, um, my first, uh, the first uh, band I saw was the Beatles when I was 12, and... Uh, he wasn't impressed. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> didn't hear a lot, didn't hear a lot, but I was on the guest list. My sister was the hair of one of the opening acts, so that's what, uh, that was, uh, that was quite an experience, and from then on, I was, uh, uh, I was always interested in music, and so I was the uh, treasurer of the Catholic Youth Club because of the treasurer got to buy the, re buy the records. Then I went on to college and booked bands at college. Uh, I guess my claim to fame was booking the 101s, which was Joe Strummer's band before The Clash. Um, and then when I came here, I was lucky enough to work in different record stores, recycled records, Zebra Records, the dairy manager was with John Coons, who then started Waterloo. Um, discovered public access and had a video show before even MTV was in town, so that was called Video's Choice, and that ran for about 12 years. When did Video's Choice start? 82. Okay. Um, wrote a little for Third Coast Magazine, um, and one of my favorite things ever was working the door of the club foot, where I got to see everyone from King Sonny of the Day, Stevie Ray Vaughan, James Brown, U2, and basically every touring act. That, it, that was kind of like my Amadillo yeah. world headquarters in terms of uh, just a, and all local bands. And my favorite of which was the Big Boys, which I produced a video for them, which you will see a little section <coughs> on here. Um, I was a roadie for Joe King Carrasco for a year, which was fun, touring with the English Beat uh, on the West Coast and the Go-Go's on the East Coast. 
coast. So uh, I was the kid in school who couldn't carry a tune in the bucket, but always wanted to be a roadie. So I was a roadie for a year, and it was great. Thankfully, got it out of my system. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, through my involvement with producing a, a video show, I did a uh, after the first South by Southwest. Louis Black said, "What did you think of it?" I thought I said I thought it was great, but where was the sort of electronic media? Where was the well, if you want to do this video, you can do something. So I did a video fest on public access, access the next year, which was about 36 hours, and then the following year, about 78 hours, and then the next year, about 128 hours. And that was basically the inspiration for the Austin Music Network, which after many years of lobbying, lobbying we got started and ended up a 24-hour music channel here in Austin, uh, and then I, of which I was the artistic director. And... Um, that changed because of uh, things change in the city. And uh, other things I've done is, is teach video classes at Laguna Gloria. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm actually proud of is being on the uh, board as Margaret is of the South Austin Popular Culture Center, which if you all haven't been to that, you really should check it out. I've also been on the board of the Texas Music Museum, which is a place well worth checking out too. And I um, would encourage you all to, uh, if you do have materials that you think might be relevant, we're always looking for magazines like the things that, that uh, Margaret had mentioned, um, any kind of uh, um, both regular press, alternative press, uh, press kits of bands, and oral histories or anything else. People often chuck stuff away and they don't realize the value of it. So we're always looking for collections of people from people to uh, to preserve our history, especially. And I'm concentrate on on uh, on music. And uh, so having said that, uh, this is a sampler of stuff that uh, is from our, our archives. And it's the introduction is Mariachi Relampago, and. Uh, uh, we did. We shot some great mariachi bands here in town. Uh, it's followed up by Willie Nelson, circa 1965, and these are just snippets, just to give you a little taste of. Uh, followed by a, a PSA from Daniel Johnston. Um, a little bit of Johnny Cash at Emos, which was one of the best yeah. events I ever attended yeah. at, at South by Southwest, I think. Um, Joe King Carrasco, uh, MTV News. At one time, I was working with people shooting. MTV actually used to pay for news, and uh, it wasn't much, it was like 200 bucks, but one of the, one of the things we did was we were joking Crasco in 1982. Um, there's a little bit of Robert Shaw that, that Margaret mentioned earlier. Uh, some True Believers, live in the back room. Um, Rocky Erickson doing a, a promo for AMN, which is, uh, I think you'll find entertaining. Uh, a little bit of the... Thunderbirds, the fabulous Thunderbirds, uh, with Stevie Ray playing with them, which is uh, quite rare footage. And uh, little Charlie Sexton, when he was, we did an MTV uh, news segment when he was 12, I think he was, playing with the Joey New Band. Mm -hmm. And of course, had to include a little Sir Douglas Quintet, which is uh, from Down on the Border, which is really a primal. Yeah. Music video. I mean, you can see by the quality of it, but the uh, the humor is there, and it's just a. <laughs> it, Especially it's a when anybody watches <laughs> Breaking Bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then there's a little bit of a of a live show. I used to do some live shows during the early South by Southwest. And it has uh, Joni Potosky interviewing Roland Swenson. And a possibly young Roland Swenson. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, asking. Does he think it was a success? Do they think they'll do it again? And so it's kind of interesting footage seeing that. And finally is a little snippet of the big boys, fun, 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 which in my opinion, the big boys are probably my favorite band ever. Um, and I just did this video from two different shoots, one at the Continental Club and one at Fiesta Gardens. And uh, my favorite bit, I think you see Brad in Fiesta Gardens telling the uh, Willies Mafia not to throw the kids back off the stage when they're stage diving and trying to explain to them they weren't fighting, they were just having fun. Right. But uh, anyway, enjoy the. Uh, Did you know that?
And when you get watching this video, go home and look up One Step Closer by Poison Tech Speed is the greatest rock video I ever made on it. Friend One Step Prince of Nuevo Huevo recently gave some of his loyal followers the chance to be queen for a day. Contestants gave one good reason why they should have the honor of being queen. After sifting through hundreds of entries, the judges selected five finalists to compete for the title at a concert held in the Austin Coliseum. The king was in top form. And so were the contestants. I'm a blonde fox and crazy just like Joe. Crazy just like Joe. Finally, it was the crowd that chose the lucky lady. The king was pleased with the crowd's choice. After the show, the queen received gifts of regal splendor, and the happy couple headed straight for the king's favorite cantina for a Tex-Mex feast. Partying with Joe King Carrasco, this is Kevin Kennedy for MTV. Texas is it's just different from other music. You, you have a feeling uh, that you're part of the music, that you're part of the soil, you're part of the country, you're part of the air. Some come and cry, some coming about to scream. Everybody hollering mercy. 
say, what do mercy mean? The blue songs that I write, they sort of built on experience. I uh, only use the time, one phrase in the black experience, you know, hard times, unable to get a job. You're deep in love with your family and with your wife and things, and you can hardly support her, you know. And then you wouldn't allow too much education because you'd probably get too smart. So the only thing you can do, or you could do, after working all day is probably on Saturdays and is go to a Saturday night supper and get the guitar players. And uh, that was sort of a social outlet, see. And what is this, man? This, this is something good, right? You're, you're watching the Austin Music Network. What? <laughs> say who you are, and say who he is, and he's gonna go, you're watching the Austin right. Music Network. Got that? Okay, you got it? What are you watching? All right. Uh, they're, they're telling me that this uh, is some kind of deal or that for what we're doing. Is that right? <laughs> you think that is? Huh? <laughs> So I'm just gonna trust you. <laughs> it, it, it didn't like cable max, did it? It, it, it didn't like cable max, did it? My name is Jago Erickson and this is my dad, Rocky Erickson. And this is the Awesome Music Network. <laughs> is that all right? Did I do good? Bless you. All right. <laughs> Actually, this is at the Opera House. For young Charles Sexton, known as Little Charlie, the dream has become a reality. As for the next few weeks, he'll be touring with one of the hottest acts in Texas, the Joe Ely Band. So I thought of somebody that that would be completely unexpected, you know, that people would never figure that uh, would get a 13-year-old guitar player. I guess we just kind of just got kind of met, you know. I played with him a couple times. And Jesse broke his hand, fought the wall. Little Charlie's chance to go on tour came about when J. 
Jesse Taylor, Joey Lee's regular lead guitarist, and broke his hand. He got up on stage with us, and we'd never seen him or heard of him either, and, and uh, he just blew us away, and this was when he was 11, which would be, what, two years ago. Some might feel that being on the road with a band is definitely not a suitable lifestyle for a 13-year-old, but little Charlie seems to take it all in stride. Band manager Chet Hansen. He loves getting on stage. He sparkles, you know, as soon as he gets up there. And if audience reaction is anything to go by, little Charlie will continue to spend a lot of his time under the bright lights in the future. Looking at the younger side of rock and roll, this is Kevin Kennedy for MTV. co-director of the conference and the director of the music festival. So any of you bands out there who have some questions for Lewis. <laughs> can I get one of those blurry I, things? I, 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 I'll do that real quick. No, so has it, been a, has it been a success? Has it reached the high heights and the low lows that you hoped? How many people reach? <laughs> it's definitely reached the low lows. I think uh, <laughs> last night we've reached the lowest low. And, and I'll publicly apologize to Jim here for the sound system problems at his show on Friday. We had... A lot of technical problems. Well, Lewis, this is I'm a question. Sorry, well, if you're working with 10 I'm kids sorry, and straight, what do you expect? I mean, I'm sorry, Jim. This is a question that's been on a lot of people's uh, minds in Austin. Uh, have we bottomed down? If we had block of seagulls last night, does it get your hair? <laughs> <laughs> I like their hair, dude. I like their hair, dude. In my opinion, yeah, that's, we bought yeah, it out. Everything will be better. Hey, yeah. dollars and cents, we're not going to get any figures. I know this is kind of a thing between you all, but uh, sold out of a uh, club. I think that's uh, very well, impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah. This Except been, why didn't you print more? Yeah. Well, we <laughs> would sell that many. And yeah. some of the figures have been bandied about or, or kind of uh -huh. What are the uh -huh. real figures? Uh -huh. Is this million, what we want to 15 million armbands sold? We made <laughs> hundreds of dollars. Okay, where are you guys going on vacation next week? This always usually tells me when are the festival. Uh, come on. I, I, we're going, I'm going to Ocumina Springs. What is <laughs> <laughs> your little tight lip? Uh, uh, the uh, on, I'm, I'm hoping for Peace Park. If I'm lucky, Zilker would be really a great three-day event. Well, that, no, but really, in all putting all seriousness aside, you guys have done a really good job. And I want to hear... <laughs> 